everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Are we on or what? Are we on? I don't see it. Super Nog with the rise, creating your voice. I am the wisdom dialoguer and the motivational warrior. We are doing season two, episode four with the property warrior. I'm going to introduce the sign and present to others. Uh, Miss Lakisa Carter, who is energetic and a passion about assisting people with their real estate needs. She epitomizes integrity, energy, and creative service in the details of each real estate transaction. Kisa strives to advocate for and attend to the real estate needs of her clients and create a positive experience for all parties involved in real estate activities. Kisa moved to the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area over 10 years ago after completing a Master's of Public Education, Public Administration at Burrup College in New York and serving eight years in the United States Air Force. Throughout her professional career, she has served the public in various professional capacities in the nonprofit, private, and government industry. When she is not helping people with their real estate needs, her hobbies include Spartan races, yoga, interior decorating, and international travel. May I introduce to some and present to others the property warder, property warrior, <laughs> Lakisa, aka known as Kisa Carter. Yay, thank you for me. <laughs> thank you for that that nice introduction. I appreciate it. And you know, as always, I love being on your show. Um, so it, I'm just so grateful you have me here today to talk about a very exciting topic, which is something I'm extremely passionate about, and that is real estate. And that is great because we understand that in real estate, we need to own something which is correct. <laughs> That's right. We do. We do. We can build wealth through real estate. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So we got to have a couple of questions and I want our definitely our listeners to come in and listen and take um, notes and also ask questions too as well. And once again, like I said, I am Judah Bernard, the Wisdom Dialogue and the Motivational Warrior. And we have a well-known person that is um, in the DMV that um, is a realtor and her name is Kisa Carter. So I'm going to start with the questions. Absolutely. How long have you been an agent and where are you licensed to conduct business? Great question. Thank you for asking. I've actually been an agent for um, almost five years. I have, however, been doing real estate full time for actually Great a year question. this month. Thank you for asking. Um, prior to actually um, being an agent, I was working full time with the federal government and um, was doing real estate part time. And now I'm actually doing it full time. So I'm currently licensed in Maryland and DC, but I'm also looking to get my license in Virginia as well. I do have people that have come to me asking me to help them with their real estate needs in Virginia. And although I was initially hesitant to get my license in all three jurisdictions, I decided it would best serve my clients who may be looking at all three jurisdictions to also go ahead with my uh, Virginia license. So I am excited about real estate. And like I said, I'm doing this full time now. And, you know, I'm just looking forward to working with more people to build wealth. That sounds great. And building wealth is important because wealth gives you a lot of um, information and a lot of money, which people want and they need. Um, but it also gives um, um, wealth for your kids and it gives an inheritance for your kids too as well. And it also builds your estate. Um, and I want to know, um, another question is, do you work full-time or part-time as an agent? Well, I'm definitely working full time right now. Um, as I was saying earlier, I would say last year in February, I made the decision to leave my full time uh, job with the federal government in order to pursue my passion of real estate and do this full time. I felt like I really can't provide the same level of service to my clients um, without having been in real estate full time. And although 
I was able to do some business as a part-time agent. Um, it's really hard because you're working a full-time job and then also trying to do real estate on the side when sometimes as demanding as the real estate industry is and the market is, you need to be available on a full-time basis. So I am doing it full-time now. And that's, that's interesting to know. So um, do you work with both buyers, sellers, and renters? I actually do. Yes, yes. I, I absolutely love my first-time home buyers. Um, you know, I tend to have the patience and then the knowledge to really explain to them how to go about just an entire real estate transaction. And so I have um, had a lot of first-time home buyers that I absolutely love working with, but I've also had some second-time home buyers or home buyers who had owned in the past and are looking to buy another property. I also have some investor clients and um, I'm working on ha you know, obtaining more sellers and people who are interested in selling their home. I think with COVID and the pandemic, it caused a lot of sellers to actually put a hold on you know, marketing their property and putting their pro property on the listing service that we provide. But I think as time moves on and people are able to obtain their vaccinations um, for COVID, you're going to see more people willing to put their home on the market and sell their property. And in addition to buyers and sellers, I also do work with renters. Um, I don't think a, a lot of people understand that as a real estate agent, we have the capability to work with renters as well. Uh, we do get listings in the multiple listing service that are actually um, properties for lease. And although it might not include apartment complexes and such, there are landlords who will list with realtors to put their townhomes, condos, and um, also their single family homes on the MLS. So I do work with buyers, sellers, and renters. Now, I heard an acronym in there. What is the MLS? That's a great question, Judah. Yes. <laughs> so there's so many different sites out there to look for your home and search for your home. I have my clients sending me homes from Redfin and um, I think Red X and um, also Zillow and all these other places. But the difference is, is realtors and real estate agents have access to what we call the multiple listing service. And that is the MLS. And that is the system that agents use to list properties. So typically any property or any information you're gonna find that's going to be the most accurate is going to be working with an agent who has access to the MLS. The third party sites such as Zillow and Redfin and I believe Zillow acquired Trulia and you'll find many others out there um, are not necessarily gonna have the most accurate information. As an example, I typically have clients sending me listings from all those various websites. And sometimes the information is inaccurate, the property has sold, or the property is actually not um, for sale. So you really, it's really a good idea to connect with an agent such as myself in order to get the most accurate information from the MLS. So you're saying that the MLS has the most accurate information. So that's interesting to know. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It definitely does um, because agents in real time can go in and update the listing if prices drop or if the property goes under contract, if the property is sold, the agents aren't going to Zillow or Redfin. They're actually going into the MLS if you're a licensed agent and you're updating that information in the MLS directly. Now, agents are able to advertise and put the listings on those third-party sites I mentioned, um, but sometimes the information doesn't necessarily catch up in real time to show you the most accurate um, information in terms of the status of that property. That's interesting information to know. Yes. How long do you usually work with the buyers? And we're going back to the buyers and first time home buyers, second time home buyers, third time home buyers, from the first home you see together to the closing table. That's a great question. Um, it can really just depend. Um, so the way it works is, you know, your first step, you know, as someone interested in purchasing 
purchasing a home would be to connect with a real estate agent. And once you do that, it really depends on the purchaser or the buyer's timeline. Um, the market is a bit crazy in the DC, Maryland and Virginia area. Yes. What I'm hearing from my real estate colleagues across the country is that it's just as crazy in cities like Houston and Charlotte and Dallas and so on. And so now it may take a little bit longer for a buyer to purchase their first, second or third home just purely because the inventory is low. Um, but if you were to get out and start looking for a home and let's just say the first day that we go out, we find your dream home, we put an offer in, the offer is accepted, we may be able to get you into a house within 30 days. Now, the likelihood of that happening in this current market could be rare only because it's such a competitive market and listing agents are experiencing multiple offer situations, whereas I know agents who have gotten 50 offers or more than 50 offers on one property. Some people are foregoing contingencies, which we can talk about later. So it might be a bit challenging to find a property and then get to the closing table in a 30 day window. So I would say anywhere from one month, um, one month's time frame to even six months. Um, but typically we're not going out for a year unless you're um, looking at purchasing new construction, which could be um, easily a year timeline. And I want to make sure that our listeners are, have if they have any questions, so I want to give our listeners an opportunity to know that if they have any questions too as well, they can start listening, um, listing them in the chat box as well. So I do want to take some questions from the listeners, but I will ask the next question. So we want to give the opportunity for the listeners to um, put their questions in the chat box, but I'll go with the next question too as well. Um, how do I personally get started with buying or selling a home? That's a great question too. All these questions are really good. They're gonna be really helpful for our audience out there. So I always say the first step is interviewing agents. As we know, there are hundreds of thousands of agents literally across the country and or maybe millions across the country. And here in the DMV, we have thousands of agents. And so your first step is connecting with an agent by interviewing that agent to see if that agent is going to be the best fit for your needs. Once you connect with an agent, most agents are going to have access to different partners, meaning your lenders, your inspectors, your you know various people that you may need assistance with throughout your transaction. So by you connecting with and interviewing a realtor, you'll get access to a number of different partners to start the process of buying your home. So I would say that would be your first um, step. Now, if you're not located in the um, DC, Maryland or Virginia area, you could still contact me because as an agent with Keller Williams Capital Properties, Keller Williams is a national um, company, real estate company that has offices throughout the US and internationally. And so for my clients that are not actually in the area or I say customers that are not actually in the area, what I tend to do is find an agent for them. Let's just say the person is living in Texas and I get um, information from that person saying they wanna purchase in Texas. Well, I can look through my network of agents in Texas, let's just say it's Dallas, find a couple of agents, interview those agents, and then refer those agents over to the customer who is living in the Dallas area. And so I may not be able to help everyone across the country, but what I can do is, you know, provide you with the service of interviewing and talking to agents in your area. So if you connect with an agent, I think everything else can sort of um, help you in the process of purchasing or selling your home. Well, it's sort of like speed dating. <laughs> yes, yes. And you know, one of the- Gotta pick the right, gotta pick the right relationship. <laughs> yeah, you know, one of the reasons why I became an agent, actually, the reason I became an agent is because I really enjoy real estate. And I actually right. started the process actually after leaving the military back in 2004. And I was looking to go to um, real estate school, pre-licensing school in Houston. 
and had signed up for classes at Champion Real Estate. And, you know, well, I won't say unfortunately, because I got selected into a graduate school program and had to put my real estate career on pause. Mm -hmm. So over 10 years later, I said, you know, it's, it's time again, you know, I really love real estate. How can I make this happen? But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely something I am completely excited about and have been, you know, I in the real estate industry for years. So would love to, 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 you know, continue to help people in any way I can with real estate. So we do have some questions, so I'm going to read them out to you. Okay. So is it better to purchase older homes? That's a really good question. So I'll just give you some examples of some recent transactions I've had here in DC and Maryland. Um, And again, I mentioned earlier that inventory is extremely limited across the country. So no matter where you go, you may have a hard time finding new construction in um, homes that are already built. And so I think it's a good idea if you're open to it to look at properties that may need some work because you may be able to get a better deal. You may be able to work with a lender who can help you with a construction loan or another loan to help you um, actually do some renovations. And so if you are open, I have clients, um, for example, that recently bought a house, I would say in December, and the house needed work, mostly cosmetic, like flooring and, you know, updated kitchen, bathrooms and things like that. And they actually got a good deal along with some seller concessions or help from the seller with their closing costs. And now they just need to put a little bit of work into it. And by doing that, they would increase the value to which when the house appraises a year or two from now, the house is going to be a bit more valuable than when from when that client actually purchased the home. So I think that at this juncture, it's important to look at all types of homes just because the market and the inventory is very limited and very low. And so if you're open to an older home, you know, you may luck out and get something that you really love. But then again, um, and I I just have to say this with people, watch out because everybody is not um, a Lakisa or a Kisa Carter. (laughs) And and I'm just going to keep, can I keep it real? Can I keep it real? Do you mind if I keep it real? Absolutely. So the thing is, Kisa's giving you this good information, but you have to assess yourself because you might go in and say, I want to own the home and you don't get a real person like Kisa Carter and she give you all the information or that person give you all the information. And then you don't assess your capabilities of buying an older home. And then they give you this older home and they don't give you all of the information that Kisa will give you. And then you go into it and then you don't get all, you know, you know how this stuff works. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) It's just like any other industry. You have your good lawyers, your bad lawyers, you have your good doctors, your bad doctors. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's just like every other industry you're not going to select the first car salesman. You're not going to select the first, exactly. you know, attorney. Um, you do your good research. <laughs> yeah, you have to do your research. You know, I have reviews that are written. I have a five-star review history. I definitely have a lot of referrals. And that's important. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> is. You know, if any of any new customers or clients, you know, wanted to talk to some of my past clients, you know, I'm happy to do that. I myself have owned, um, purchased and owned three homes. And so I know what it's like to be on the other end and having to sell a home. I've been on that end as well. And so some realtors I enjoyed working with others, it wasn't a party. It wasn't fun. And so you definitely want to make sure that whoever you choose, if it's not me, yours truly, um, you want to do a good job of selecting them and just make sure it's a good fit. Exactly. Um, for you. So that is a really good point, um, Judah, because not all realtors or, are the same. And not all realtors are going to provide you the level of education exactly. that you need to make an informed decision. An informed decision is important because someone will sell you um, like a used car salesman. Yeah. I'm just going to put that out there because my the rise creating your voice is about truth and transparency. So I want to put that out there and it's not downgrading anybody, but it's about truth and transparency because that's what people do. Yes, absolutely. Just saying. 
And that's not saying anything about any particular anybody, but we just have that in the world. <laughs> yes, yes. And you know, truthfully, I'm not a commission chaser, um, to be right. honest with you. Yes, I have to make a living selling real estate and helping buyers purchase real estate. But I also know no one likes to go to the used car salesman who's going to harass them on a daily basis with text messages, emails, calling you, you know, sort of forcing you into a transaction you're not really excited about. Um, yeah. Personally, the approach that I take with my clients and customers is I provide a level of education yes. to allow them to really decide if this is what they really want. For most people, purchasing a home is going to be the biggest investment that you've ever made in your mm -hmm. entire life. Um, especially in the DMV, you're going to spend nearly half a million dollars or more for your first home. And so yes. it's important that, you know, you don't have someone who's not going to give you the level of service that you need in order to make a really educated decision about buying a home. And so I tend to take my time with my clients um, and provide them the information they need so that they can move forward with a smooth transaction. Okay, next next question. Okay. What does my credit score need or have to be in order to secure a good interest rate? And we're talking about a good interest rate. A good one, right? I know. That's a, that's a million dollar question, right? Yeah. You know, I always like to tell this story. So when I bought my first house back in 2004, I think it was, I always tell people my interest rate was like 8%. Right. Oh. And that was like the standard. And so now when you talk about, for example, I just refinanced my home that I currently live in and my interest rate is 2.25%, which is outrageous to me. And so what I tell people is that, yes, you have to have a level of credit that's going to be, allow you to purchase a home. Now I'm not a lender, so I don't like to jump in the lender lane as I call it, as I yeah. uh, call it. But what I can tell you is that prior to COVID, lenders were allowing um, home purchases with credit scores as low as 580. Mm. Now since the pandemic, that's changed, um, and you have some lenders, especially when you're talking about the government loans such as USDA, FHA, or the right. VA Veterans Affairs loan. Um, you may be able to get away with a lower credit, lower than 700. So maybe 620, 640. But what I typically like to do is connect you with a, uh, a lender. And I have some lenders who are much like me. They like to educate you on the process, look at where you're at in terms of your credit worthiness and tell you where you need to get in order to purchase a home. But I advise all of my clients to use either Credit Karma Credit Sesame or the annual free credit report website to understand what your credit is and understand what your credit score is according to um, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. It's going to be slightly different when the wow. lender runs your credit, so keep that in mind, but at least you have some knowledge about what you what you may need to work on, maybe you don't need to work on it in order to get approved for a loan. And if you reach out to me, I'm happy to, I have lots of lenders. I absolutely love each one I work with. I vet each lender I work with. I've had either had coffee with them, a Zoom call, or I've you know met them in person. So you're not gonna work with anyone I wouldn't work with on my own personal transactions. And, um... One thing is we have to understand that we have to look at risk. And the one thing is other people have to understand too is debt to income ratio too as well. Absolutely. That's important. That's important. That's yes. important. Absolutely. You do have to have some <laughs> income. And what I tell people that have credit cards and this can be impactful on your credit score. Yes is if you're using more than 30, let's just keep it at 30% util yes. utilization in terms of yes. your credit cards. So if you have a credit card limit that is $1,000 and you have maxed it to use $900 of that $1,000 limit, it's gonna make, it's gonna drop, it's gonna impact your credit score. Yes. Your credit score will drop. Now, if you, that same $1,000 credit limit if you're using it to buy, you know, gas, maybe some groceries and you're paying it off every month and you're keeping it under 30%, then your credit is going to be okay. 
And so your debt to income makes it in a huge difference if you have a ton of debt and no income or low income, you know, that's going to impact what you may qualify for. Right. Now, if you have a t- ton of debt and you have, you know, a higher income, you know, that's going to in- make your credit ratio, um, debt to income ratio a lot different and you still yes. qualify for more home. Um, but again, you have to talk to a lender to kind of get a better idea of, you know, what can I do? Um, there's also programs out there that in the state of Maryland, for example, they will help pay off some of your student debt. Right. I know that there are banks that have programs for doctors um, and others in different professions that may be able to help you with closing costs, down payment assistance, which I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later as yes. well. So. And you have a question here, and I don't know if they want me to read it, but I'll read it anyway. Okay. They said, I disputed a few items on my credit that were incorrect and removed, but my credit score dropped 11 points. How does, how does that affect me? And I would probably tag on to that. Absolutely. Um, it depends on if you were paying on time or if that affected, um, if, if it was incorrect, um, it could drop 11 because it could have been effective <laughs> on, your, on your credit report, but you disputed it. Now it dropped off. So those 11 points was taken off because it could have helped you. But now that you disputed it, those 11 points got taken off. So that could have helped you. So, yeah. Absolutely. And the other thing is you have to keep in mind, and this is without me knowing the entire story, right. I'm not a credit you know, repair guru, but I do help my clients with providing them with tools and resources to dispute you know, their credit issues and things like that. So if you contact me, I'm certainly happy to provide you that. But the thing is, I know that when you do close a an account, um, and it doesn't really matter what type of account it is, right. that can have a tremendous impact on your yes. credit. So if you had a credit card or an a, a issue on your credit, you disputed it, and then the account is closed, that could impact your credit. Definitely could impact so, it definitely depends. And, you know, I, I would need to know a little bit more information and right. give you some guidance, but there's certainly some good resources again on Credit Sesame and Credit Karma that tell you why your credit score could drop. And I'm happy. I have a ton of resources in an email. I'm happy to send to anyone who sends me an email. Um, and what's that email address they can send, send that to you so I can put that out there if you don't mind? Absolutely. So my email address is the property warrior at outlook.com and that's the (laughs) t-h-e-p-r-o-p-e-r-t-y w-a-r-r-i-o-r at outlook.com send it to her with that question so she may answer it and send you the necessary resources that's right all right so can you talk about credit we did talk about credit just a few minutes ago And how you qualify for a home loan. Yes, yes. So just to add on to that, you know, lenders are going to look at several things, um, including your credit, including your um, income, including, you know, whether you have um, other types of payments out there. Are you employed? You know, things like that. Um, On the back of my business card, I actually do have a list of the things that lenders will require in order to complete your loan application. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I would recommend is, you know, if you're thinking about buying a home, don't go out and make any big purchases. Don't go out and open up credit accounts (laughs) because that's definitely going to have an impact. You can't get some new furniture. (laughs) Yeah, you can't go buy the furniture without the house first. So if you're thinking about going, you know, to Marlowe Furniture or Ikea, Or wherever and buying seven thousand dollars worth of furniture, which I don't know if you can even do at IKEA because it's right. so cheap. But you know, you don't want to spend all that money and then say, "Okay, now I'm going to buy my house." Because guess right. what? The lender is going to see that on your credit, and they're going to say, "Well, why do you have seven thousand dollars in new debt? You know, what are you really doing here?" And so, if you have a a lot of open accounts and your payments aren't on time, that is another thing that's going to impact yeah. you because what you're telling a lender is. You're not making you're not making timely payments on accounts that you already have open. So should that lender then believe that you will make timely payments on your um, mortgage? 
And that's important because mm -hmm. banks are not in the uh, business to own a home. Banks don't like foreclosures. They don't want that on their role. Right. Banks are in the business to make money and having to foreclose on, you know, a property is not something that they want to do, nor do they like to do. So there are a lot of um, factors that that come into play in terms of getting approved for a loan. Oh, that's that that was some great information. I hope you guys are writing this stuff down because we're not coming back on here to talk about it again. I'm just playing. <laughs> All right. We 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 have another we, we have another once. question. We have another question. Okay. How do you feel about leasing out your property? Do you feel you should use a realtor as well as a property management company? I plan to lease out my current residence in a few years and wanted your thoughts. I hear both sides. Great to lease out property and, and it's a nightmare. Yeah, this I've been through that. So lots to say on that. So I'll try to keep it short. So it really just depends on the person. Yeah. Some people are not excited about real estate like I'm excited about real estate. And so they do <laughs> not want to be a landlord, nor do yeah. they want to be in the process of screening tenants and dealing with that entire situation. But on the other hand, when you have a property management company, you have to manage the property management company. Yeah. As an example, when I left Houston to go to grad school, I still owned some homes and I had a property management company that did not do their job. Mm. I did not manage my property management company and it cost me close to $20,000 mm. and a lot of fees I'm not going to get into on this forum. But if anyone's interested in my story, I'm happy to share. So with that said, um, as an example, I have um, two rental listings currently on the MLS um, from a landlord who was using a realtor prior to um, using or hiring me and, and, and to take the process all the way through completing the actual lease. And so what that means is I've listed the property, I've advertised the property, I have went over and straightened up the property a bit, not that it was super dirty or anything, hired a photographer to take pictures of the property, um, set up a link so that applicants can go on and apply online. I contacted all the uh, references and employers um, and uh, current landlords for those applicants. So I'm actually doing a good amount of the pre-work in terms of getting the tenant into the property. Now this, I don't own a property management company and I don't currently manage other people's properties. Um, but what I would recommend is if you're going to hire a property management company, number one, ask for their references. Yes. Number two, make sure they yes. do quarterly checks of your property or by uh, year, by uh, biannual checks. Um, and number uh, three, you need to manage your property management company no one's going to care about your house as much as you care about your house, whether it's a rental, um, your primary residence or whatnot. So if you're going to hire a property management company, uh -huh, yeah. can I say something? Make sure they're in the state that say, your house yes, is in. Absolutely. <laughs> say that again. Make sure they're say in that the one state more that, time. Make sure they're in the state that your house is in. Cause sometimes they're not in that state. They're in Arizona and your house is in California. <laughs> That's true. So you definitely want to make sure if you hire a property management company, they're in the state that your house is in. Whether you're living in Texas and your property rental property is in Arizona, find a good reputable property management company in that state. You can start by contacting agents. Usually agents do know of, you know, property managers. I know that there is two agents in my office who I believe started a property management company in Montgomery County. So I do know of some good property managers in the local area, but you definitely want to spend the time vetting um, these property managers and it's going to cost you, you know, you may pay a monthly percentage, sometimes eight to 10%, maybe more. And um, you, you may have a, an escrow to um, hold some money in, in case there are repairs that may be needed to your property. So if you have more questions about, you know, any of that, feel free to, you know, contact me and, you know, we can talk it over. And that's the property warrior at outlook.com. Yes. And then all my, all my social media tags or handles, I'm sorry, are the property warrior on Instagram. I don't use Twitter much. I am on there. And of course, <laughs> Facebook, I do have a business page. So you can contact me through those um, methods as well.
And thank you guys for your, your questions and things. And we're going to move to the next question. Can you recommend vendors, for example, lenders, inspectors, general contractors, et cetera? And what is the market life like in the DMV area? And that's DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Great question. So any agent, any good agent, dare I say, is going to partner with, you know, every person or company or business that's going to have some involvement in the real estate transaction. So whether that be your lender, your inspectors, um, a general contractor, an HVAC guy or a gal, you know, um, a plumber, you know, anything that you need or has an impact on your home. And so, yes, uh, agent should have access to those vendors and those partners. You know, if you're a new agent and you're new in the business, you may not have built that, you know, list up just yet. But as far as myself, I do have knowledge of, you know, people who could help you, um, whether you're trying to do renovations or if you need, like I said, some good lenders, or I have a ton of property inspectors who are who just do a phenomenal job when you have to go through the inspection process. And so, yes, it is good to have um, partners and to know realtors that actually have partners so that you don't have to go seek out and interview and read reviews of all these people. Um, I um, am required I believe by being a realtor in the state of Maryland and the jurisdiction of uh, the District of Columbia to work with licensed uh, individuals, licensed companies. So if they're a general contractor in Maryland, they have to be licensed in Maryland. So I'm never going to refer you to a person, a general contractor who's not licensed in the jurisdiction where you're doing business. Um, as far as the market, we touched on that a little bit, but the market is, dare I say, crazy. Um, most of my clients can attest to this. It's always typically been a multiple offer situation. And for most of my clients, we've had to put in more than one offer. And it's not because the offer wasn't strong. It's because you have people out here who are paying cash. Yep, cash for $700,000 homes. They are not taking an appraisal or not getting an appraisal, which you cannot do that if you're getting financed through an FHA, USDA, or VA loan. They're foregoing inspection contingencies and they're offering more than list price. So for example, I have a, a colleague who sold a property in DC. It was listed for, I believe, 700, around 700,000. The offer that they selected among many, they uh, offer, I think, $95,000 more than the list price. There was no inspection and no appraisal contingency, and they could close fairly quick. And so many people misunderstand now that you can actually work with a lender and get more than just a pre-approval. And so back in the day, Prior to COVID and even longer maybe, people were excited once they got their pre-approval. But a pre-approval is not necessarily um, going to take you all the way through reviewing all of your documents um, by a lender, meaning that the lender is only going to look at your credit. Maybe they you know, get some pay stubs. Maybe they ask you what your salary is. And they decide based on very limited um, you know, paperwork that you are credit worthy and you can qualify for this level of home. But there are some lenders out there that will do a more thorough job of actually what they call underwriting your application to actually give you an approval versus a pre-approval. Well, to be competitive in this market, you have to have something more like an approval, meaning that there's been some level of underwriting that has occurred by the lender um, to say, yeah, this transaction is likely going to go through. Likely we're going to be able to fund this loan because we've verified all of these documents that the applicant, the buyer, has provided to that lender. Um, so you want to talk with a lender or make sure you're working with the lender that's going to do that for you and uh, make work with a lender who can close quickly 
um, one that if you need to close this transaction in three weeks, that they can do that because gone are the days to have a 45 day closing, 60 day mm. closing. If you're trying to wait around and close, you know, in 60 days, unless that owner or that seller is willing to stay in the property because they want to rent it back because they're waiting to purchase another house, then you're more than likely these sellers are going to want to close quickly and um, know that the, the transaction is going to go smoothly. Y'all hear that, Don? Gone all yeah. the days. <laughs> <laughs> Better get in there. Um, so, <laughs> woo. Yeah. So if I don't live in the DMV, mm -hmm. how can you help me? I know you answered this earlier. I know you have national uh, people since Keller. Uh, Williams is a national agent. You can call an agent and have mm -hmm. people work in the Dallas region and the other regions and call them. So Absolutely. you kind of answered it if you want to expound on that again. Yeah, just, you know, you can reach out to me. The great thing about being with a large uh, company is I have access to literally agents internationally. I looked up agents in Mexico, you know, not too long ago, um, Costa Rica, you know. So if you're interested in buying internationally, you need an agent, contact me. You're in Florida. Dominican Republic? Uh, I believe Cali Williams may be there. I'll have to double check. Please but do. we're definitely in a lot of locations um, internationally. So yeah, reach out to me. I'm happy to, I know what questions to ask, right? So lawyers know what question to, questions to ask other lawyers. Realtors know what questions to ask other realtors. So if you want a realtor to go in and interview another realtor for you, contact me. I'm happy to do that. And do we have any other question as we're coming to our 15 minute mark, but I'm going to keep asking questions. Um, how do you help buyers compete and stand out in this buyer's market? Yes, the question of the hour. Ooh, yes. It's hard. Let me tell you, there's some things that I mentioned early, but I'm going to expand on those just a bit. So it's not to say that you can't get an offer accepted for lower than what the, the home is listed for, because I have been able to do that with some of my buyers um, for homes that need some renovations. However, most times, um, just in my experience and other agents I've, taught, I've spoken to in the last, you know, I would say within the last year or so, most homes are being sold for more than list price and sellers are less inclined to provide you with seller assistance, seller concession, seller help. You know, there's different terms for it that could help you with closing costs. I've been able to do it successfully, but for the most part, it's been with um, properties that need some work, some level of work, you know, some renovations and such. And so in order to make a stronger offer, um, I also ask my clients to write a personal letter. Um, that personal letter can reflect why they love the home, you know, a little bit about them, personalize it because homes are really near and dear to people kind of like pets. And so if a person living in a home is a veteran and they served our country, and then you have a veteran buyer who wants the home and that veteran buyer then writes a personal letter, their letter may stand out to that veteran homeowner and maybe they are more likely to select that offer if it's, you know, it has some good terms. So a personalized letter is good. Um, foregoing, although I dare I say this, but there are a lot of purchasers and buyers who are foregoing home inspections. Mm -hmm. Yikes. I really don't like that because I think you need to know, you know, what is happening with the home. But in order to be com competitive, there's another buyer out there that's, you know, will say, I don't even want to do a home inspection because there's something wrong with the house, I'll just fix it. Um, and that's purely because there's limited inventory. I don't personally like to recommend that. I just provide the facts and provide that this is what's happening um, in this current market. And if you know buyers choose not to do a home inspection, then they choose not to do a home inspection. Um, there are sellers selling homes as is, meaning that even if you do a home inspection, they're, they're going to make no repairs nor are they going to pay for any repairs. And so you have to go into it knowing that that could be um, a stipulation. Um, the other thing is 
Can you offer a quick closing? Are you working with a reputable, reputable lender? I have a client right now working with Navy Federal Credit Union. Gotta love those veteran banks mm. and you know those credit unions. But mm. the sooner that Navy Federal can close a loan is 45 days. Mm. So if you're a seller and you can close, you have a buyer who has submitted a um, you know, submitted an offer. One buyer can close in three weeks and the other can close in 45 days. Even if it's more money, for example, the three weeks may win the deal because maybe that seller is trying to move to Florida and get away from this crazy <laughs> cold weather. Right. So it, you have to get creative. Sometimes more money is not necessarily going to win your right. offer. It could be a variety of different reasons why. I tend to ask the seller or the listing agent not the seller, but the listing agent, if an offer didn't get accepted on behalf of one of my buyers, I'll call them up or email them and say, hey, what could have made our offer stronger? Why didn't our offer get accepted? So that way I can educate my buyer as to why the offer didn't get accepted. One of the last trend, um, offers I wrote, which was actually just a couple of days ago, the offer was not accepted because the person for, uh, they did not need an appraisal there was no inspection and they offered more than the listed price. How can you beat that if you have a VA loan or an FHA loan? You have to get an appraisal. It's required by the government. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty challenging. And, um, you know, there's other solutions that if you contact me, we can talk about strategies, but you definitely have to be creative in this market. Yeah, I hear that, Donna. <laughs> Gotta be creative. <laughs> Gotta be real creative. Don't be sitting there trying to get a six a day. Thing yeah. Knowing that person got two weeks to get out of there and move the floor. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And be sure you have um earnest money deposit. I failed to mention that. Make sure you but, got your uh, cash money. Make sure you just cash out yeah. your uh 401k right quick. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You definitely, and I don't know if all of you know, you know, out there what earnest money is, but it's it's basically a deposit and you're telling the seller, hey, in earnest, you know, I have some money in my account. Here's a check or here's a wire transfer to the title company to say, you are serious. You're a serious buyer. You want to move forward. Hold on to this money. And, and what um, happens? Is, oh, go ahead. Kisa, what is some good earnest money? Because I think people think $1,000 is earnest money. Oh, yeah. $1,000 <laughs> is good earnest money if you're buying a home for $5,000. Okay, or $20,000, <laughs> let me say. But if you want to buy a house for $500,000, you would probably more than likely get um, you know, more interest <laughs> by that seller if it's 3%. So typically in this area um, and other areas may be different. I can only speak for the DMV or yeah. DC in Maryland because that's where I'm licensed is typically you're looking at one to 3%. I tell my clients at least 2%, 3% yeah. is going to get you a, oh, this person's serious. They have the cash. They're ready to rock and roll. Right. So it's up to you. Um, that earnest money is going to be deposited with a title company, a settlement company where the settlement company actually represents the transaction, not the buyer or the seller. They handle the transaction. They'll hold it in escrow and that money will be used towards your closing costs. And so it's not like that money is just going to sit there. It's not going to apply to anything. It's going to be used. And if for some reason you do have an inspection contingency and you want to walk away, void the contract because the inspections show that there's mold growing all over the house and termites are about to, you know, eat it. Um, until there's no house left, then you can always have that option and you would get right. your earnest money deposit back, depending on the type of contingencies you have in the offer. So you just have to be careful, but you definitely don't want to offer a $1,000 earnest money deposit on a $500,000 home. The listing agent will probably laugh, to be honest. <clears throat> we have a question. Sure. What are your thoughts on kitchen renovations? My kitchen is a little outdated. I want to do some renovations. However, I heard that it isn't worth it unless you plan on selling. Pretty much a tenant won't care as much. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so... Um, Depending on what's question. outdated. Yeah, <laughs> it definitely depends. So what I will say is that kitchens and bathrooms bring the most value. So if yes, you buy it does. a property... 
you know, and you decide you want to update the kitchen and bathroom, you know, six months to a year later, you get an appraise. The appraiser is going to come in and ask you, have you made any, you know, updates? You're going to say, I did some updates in my kitchen and bathroom. Bam, you know, you, you, it probably will appraise for a higher value than what you paid for it. On the other hand, if you're looking to sell your property, and we're actually going through this with a listing, a, a client, a seller client right now. Um, so we went over to the client's house um, because, you know, all agents are going to want to do a walkthrough of the house in order to determine, you know, how to best advise on what they can price their home at and put it on the market. And that seller asked, you know, myself and my co-listing um, agent if they should update one of their bathrooms. And based on the rest of their house, which was in great condition, they had renovated one of the bathrooms, the kitchen was in good condition, everything was, you know, pretty much in good condition other than we made the re uh, recommendation of updating some of their door handles, little stuff that doesn't cost a lot of money. What we told them is to hold off because the market is so crazy and it's really a seller's market. Even if you, if you have a functioning bathroom and everything works and it still is in um, like move in ready condition, the buyer can move in and use the bathroom, then depending on the market, you may still be able to get top dollar for your house according to what the comps are in the area, the comparables, and not have to put the money into updating the bathroom. And so if you're planning to lease the property or rent the property out, you don't want, you know, $50,000 worth of upgrades or, or renovations in a bathroom if it's going to be a rental. So what I would ask that person is, is the bathroom functioning? You know, is it clean? Um, and if it is, then you may not really want to update it because tenants, you know, dare I say this, but, you know, I always feel like people aren't necessarily always going to take care of your property like it's their own. Um, there are great tenants out there, don't get me wrong, but, you know, they're renting, right? And I've been a renter and yeah, I take, took care of the property, but I'm a little bit more cautious, you know, with certain things in my house. Like I'm not grinding food in my um, garbage disposal like I did in an apartment because I know that eventually over time, the more chicken bones I throw in my garbage disposal, I'm going to have to pay for that versus calling the maintenance man. <laughs> So, you know, and it's not anything big, right? I still kept the apartment clean, but cost money. And little did I know how much money they actually cost. <laughs> and I literally have to get a, a garbage disposal with a higher amps right. because you know, we're grinding food in there. But the garbage disposal isn't meant to grind food. Did I At know all. that? I no. know. <laughs> you know, I didn't know that. I'd throw everything in there. You certainly don't want to throw grease or oil in there. When I lived in an apartment, did I throw grease and oil? In the garbage disposal, wink, wink. Yes, I did. Should I have done that? Probably not. At my house, if you come to my house and you threw oil in my sink, we're probably going to fight, and you're never going to be invited back again. So Ever I have to say, you know, keep it very minimal right. in terms of renovations for you know any rental properties. You know, you just want just enough to where if the jurisdiction comes to inspect it, everything is functioning. Yeah. You know, especially if you're going to be renting to, you know, um, public vouchers, you know, people with public vouchers and things like that, veterans with vouchers and things like that. You definitely have to have things in working order. So hopefully that helps answer that question. And as we close, Kisa, I want to thank you for coming on. But in two minutes, can you explain the home buying process from start to finish? Let me talk really, 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 really fast. No. So um, contact a realtor, contact a realtor, contact a realtor, contact a realtor. But no, essentially you're contacting a real realtor. They're referring a lender. You are applying for that, not pre-approval, but approval. You are um, then get set up to receive properties automatically. So you can choose what properties you want to go look at. You call me. I take you out to look at a property. You like the property you see, we make an offer, you fill out the forms, I submit the offer, the seller accepts your offer, offer is signed by seller and buyer, we go to settlement, we close on the property, there you, now you're a homeowner. 
in between all that, there's several things happening like the inspection and appraisal and things of that nature. But when you have a good agent, they're going to keep you on track, make sure you stick to the timelines. But that's it, essentially. You're going to, you know, get the pre-approval, find your dream home, settle on your dream home. And again, that timeline can be anywhere from a month to six months, you know, hopefully shorter than a year. But, you know, it is taking a little bit longer to purchase a home. So I'm hoping everyone has taken notes. Um, hopefully um, you go ahead and remodel that kitchen. Because I'm going to tell you, Judah loves a kitchen. You, you have to have a kitchen. I'm sure C.P. Peterson loves a kitchen too. So yes. go ahead and tell us, C.P. Peterson, go ahead and remodel that kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We get that kitchen remodeled. Please remodel um, that kitchen. So we love we love a kitchen. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm be the first to tell you. Remodel that kitchen. Go ahead and put those, uh, uh, what they call it, stainless steel appliances in there. <laughs> yes. No, no white appliances. No, and that granite no countertop. <laughs> yes. No linoleum floors. Oh, none of that. please, no. Give me some hard wood or something. Just something that I'm going to, yeah, please. Yes. Um, but um, this information has been great. And, I, and I'm and i hoping everyone who has come in and has taken notes and able and definitely reach out to Kisa. Um, she has been a great um, resource and information for us today. And like I said, this will be in podcast form come February 21st and part of season um, two, episode um, four, because it's about moving forward. Hopefully everybody ready to move forward, buying real estate, selling properties, being able to be able to build well, um, being able to be an inheritance to your loved ones. Um, um, you know, once you move forward, once you transition, you know, it's about move, moving forward, moving forward to the next thing and being able to buy more property, buy more land, just build a wealth for yourself and for your family and for um, um, the, the next generation. Um, right. And I just want to thank um, Kisa for being um, very informative on today. Um, as I, as everyone already knows, I am Jude Bernard, the Wisdom Dialogue and the Motivational Warrior. And as I always say, tell a friend, tell a phone, tell your spouse, heck, tell everyone. Hopefully we'll see you guys on the next podcast, um, Facebook Live, wherever we may be, maybe on the street in Houston, Texas. Maybe we'll see you at another cook show, live show, wherever it may be. We'll see you and we'll greet you in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and also in love, peace, hair grease, but also in real estate. We'll see you later and goodbye and good night and have a great Monday. Bye. Thank you guys. <laughs>